Hello, Adam's children. Welcome to this week's sermon. Please make yourselves comfortable while I deliver Adam's message. In the ever-evolving pursuit of knowledge, I have started to remaster my old content to bring the information up to a higher standard, the videos to a higher quality, and to correct mistakes. So, I present to you the semi-automatic and automatic rifles of Fallout, one of my earliest videos. So relax while I deliver that sweet lore straight into your ears. And remember that I have my comment highlights at the end of the video, going over a few weeks worth of comments. But turn up the rads, you mad lads, and let's get on to the video. The Chinese assault rifle in Fallout 3 is a great companion, being both plentiful and possessing enough punch to get the lone wanderer through everything but probably the endgame. Officially known as the Type 93, which can be seen stamped into the metal, the weapon uses 5.56mm ammunition and does decent damage, while having a pretty high DPS, making it stand out among all assault rifle options in Fallout 3. All the other stats are otherwise not that remarkable. There are a few unique variants in Fallout 3, as well as some cut ones. The most well-known unique version is the Xuanlang assault rifle that is the most powerful of all the variants. Doing a bit more damage and slightly higher critical damage, it can be repaired with the normal Chinese rifle that is very commonplace in the wasteland. The Xuanlang rifle can be obtained by completing the Jig's Loot Quest, where after completing the puzzles in the Museum of Technology, the player will encounter the dead body of Prime, which will have the rifle on it. Prime's body will not be found if the player has not finished the quest though. Xuanlang refers to what we translate as the Black Dragon in English. Jericho, a resident of Megaton and potential companion if the player has bad karma, has his own version of the Chinese assault rifle that cannot be used by the player. Since Jericho is usually an early game companion, the rifle has been nerfed in almost every way except for its spread, which gets a 50% buff. The Sim version is the one that can be used in the Operation Anchorage DLC and is not equipable outside of the DLC without console commands. It has so much health as to be functionally invincible, since weapon degradation is not meant to feature in the simulation. It has a colder color metal finish and slightly cleaner look, like the wood furniture not looking as weathered. There are two cut variants, one that does a crazy 1000 damage and only appears in Operation Anchorage and is used in an event trigger. One cut version, called the Chinese Dragoon Assault Rifle, was meant to be found in the Operation Anchorage DLC, and I'm starting to sense a trend here. It is identical to the Sim version. Due to the name, it is likely that it was meant to feature either in the DLC itself, wielded by the formidable Chinese unit, the Crimson Dragoons, or possibly as a weapon reward that along with the Gauss Rifle and winterized T-51B power armor can be given to the player after completing the simulation. Some interesting facts about the Type 93 in Fallout 3 is that a propaganda poster found in Operation Anchorage shows one with a bayonet that isn't ever seen in game. Another thing we never get to see in game is the stock used for the Pip-Boy icon of the Chinese assault rifle, as it shows the Type 93 with a solid stock and not the wireframe one that we get. Although the rifle does not show up in Fallout New Vegas, part of one can be seen in the How Little We Know quest where a stockpile of weapons are destroyed and the barrel of one can be seen. Fallout 4 does not officially have the Chinese assault rifle, although there is a cut and unfinished weapon that uses the exact model seen in Fallout 3, although it is untextured. It is really a shame that this weapon was never included in the game. Fallout 76 has the Type 93 in a manner of speaking. Early in the life of Fallout 76, it existed only as a cut model, just like in Fallout 4. However, it has since been released as a custom weapons mod for the handmade rifle. The Chinese assault rifle grip and rifle barrel mods changed the look of the handmade rifle into the Type 93, similar to how the handmade rifle will have its looks altered to look like the Type 93 when the player uses the red shift paint scheme which gives everything a Chinese communist style. There's also some lore in Fallout 76 pertaining to the Type 93, a secret Chinese base, 
called the Fujinia Intelligence Base, has a terminal entry where they ordered 75 of these rifles and 1,200 rounds of 5.56, but the request was permanently delayed. Perhaps this is the reason for a lack of Type 93 rifles in Appalachia. They tried to get some shipped in, but the shipment couldn't come. There are many interesting questions and considerations when it comes to this rifle. First off, the model in Fallout 76 looks great, and it is so disappointing that it was not included in Fallout 4 or 76 as an actual rifle. The huge number of Type 93s in the Capital Commonwealth would speak to the massive infiltration that occurred in the pre-war. It appears that DC was unknowingly swimming in Chinese weapons, which is something not seen in Boston up north or Appalachia out west. There are several weapons simply called Assault Rifle, but the one we will look at here is the Assault Rifle from Fallout and Fallout 2. Known officially as the AK-112, the item description describes the weapon's past, detailing that it was used in the early 21st century, but had been replaced by the time of the Great War, and was considered inferior to later options. The weapon is chambered in 5mm, and is a capable weapon, only being outshined by late game weapons. It can be toggled between single shot and burst fire, and found or bought in several places in both games. There is no direct inspiration, and it's difficult to make much out of the low resolution, but it does remind me of an FN FAL in some ways, just with a blockier upper receiver, the front sight fixed to the barrel, and a straight line stock. In the Fallout demo, the rifle is actually named the Colt Rifle, and in Fallout 2, the player can upgrade the weapon to receive an extended magazine, increasing the capacity to 100 rounds, making burst fire a lot more effective. It is interesting to note that the prefix AK would seem to indicate that this weapon is Russian in origin, since it stands for Automat Kalishnikova, and that pattern also holds for the Fallout world, since the AK-47 features in tactics. The implications for that would be pretty interesting though, since it would mean that the West Coast has a large amount of old Russian assault rifles rather than any American options. Did Russia and the US have better relations? I'd like to hear your best thoughts and justifications for this. Speaking of the AK-47, it is available to use in Fallout Tactics, and the description states that the AK-47 is considered the best assault rifle ever made because of its reliability, ruggedness, and accuracy. That is quite the statement, and in tactics, it is quite a capable weapon that is widely available. The AK is a good mid-game weapon, but will need to be replaced with harder-hitting weapons in the late game. The so-called Assault Rifle of Fallout 3 has the official name of the R91, and is very readily available and widely used in the Capital Wasteland. While weaker than the Chinese Assault Rifle, it trades that raw damage for more durability and higher critical damage, although it shoots the same 5.56mm round. The R91 was manufactured by a defense contractor known as Stent Security Solutions and was meant to replace an unseen rifle that was part of a so-called M-Series that was retired in the early 21st century. It is stated in a terminal at the Citadel that the National Guard uses the R91 as standard issue, and since the National Guard was widely deployed before the Great War for urban pacification operations, it is very easily found. The R91 is a one-for-one -one representation of the CETME rifle Modelo C, which was the basis of the much more well-known Heckler & Koch G3. In fact, even though it has all the details of the Modelo C, the in-game files refer to it simply as the G3. There are several versions of the weapon that can be found thanks to the Pit DLC. The Infiltrator is an all-black, scoped, and silenced version of the R91 that is missing its stock. It has slightly lower damage than the normal R91 and a bit higher critical damage. The critical hits are the key to this weapon, since it is even weaker than the normal R91 and the silencer assists in racking up these criticals. Multiple sneak criticals are possible when firing while concealed, which will really pile on the damage. It can only be obtained in the pit, and can be found used by Gruber 
an enemy that the Lone Wanderer fights in the combat arena known as the Hole. It is also used by Mex and his compatriots as they stand guard in the downtown area. I have to seriously question the effectiveness of equipping a rifle with a scope while also removing the stock. The Perforator is not only similar in name to the Infiltrator, but is also only found in the pit and shares the exact same model. It is superior to the Infiltrator and the R91 in almost every way. Raw damage, critical damage, critical multiplier, and spread, but it does require extra AP. The weapon is obtained from Everett, the ugly dude that rewards you for finding steel ingots after finding and returning 90 of those blasted things. Good job giving a slave one of the best weapons, Everett. It cannot be repaired with infiltrators, even though they look exactly the same, but it can be repaired with the much more common assault rifle, so there's not really much to complain about. It's just kind of odd. Since the R91 is used in the Operation Anchorage DLC, there is a sim version, and it has massive health and an altered texture that is cleaner than the versions found in the Capital Wasteland. There is a cut version named Wanda that was meant to be the unique version of the R91 whose stats were just as good as the Xuanlong rifle, but it had even more HP. Unfortunately, it cannot be obtained any other way than console commands. If you have any idea as to why the rifle name is Wanda, I'd really like to hear it. Lastly, a cut version of the weapon called in the game files Alloy Steel Assault Rifle was likely meant to feature in the Operation Anchorage DLC, either in-game or again as a reward for finishing the simulation, similar to the cut Chinese assault rifle. Although the R91 only features in Fallout 3 for some reason, it shows up on a sign for the Commonwealth Weaponry Shop in Fallout 4. It also shows up in the Commando perk in Fallout New Vegas and perk cards in Fallout 76. So it may be gone, but it's not forgotten. So it is established why the weapon is found in the Capital Wasteland, but there is no stated reason for why it isn't found in many other places. Perhaps these weapons seem to be only used in certain areas because the 13 commonwealths that were established in the years before the Great War had more autonomy than we originally thought, making their own standards, even if it conflicts with other commonwealths. The peak of the Fallout series, known as the legendary Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, has its own assault rifle pictured here. It is found in the late game and is a very capable weapon using the commonly found small bullet. Only the secret vault has this weapon, meaning that it was supplied by vault tech and isn't found anywhere else, so it can't be all that common. It appears to be largely inspired by the LR300, which is a modified version of the M4 carbine developed by ZM Weapons between 2000 and 2007, which is the time window that Fallout Brotherhood of Steel was released in. And that's all I have to say about that. The FNFAL of Fallout 2 is an exact representation of the real world FAL. It uses 7.62 mm ammunition, and it hits harder than the AK-112 we spoke of earlier, but with a lower range and capacity. It is a solid choice that is really only limited by the small magazine size and widely available from many merchants and carried by many enemies. The FNFAL HPFA stands for High Power Full Automatic and is also available in Fallout 2 with the unique ability of shooting its entire clip each time it's fired. And it's the only small gun that can do over a thousand damage on a critical. I really hope you like reloading though, because you'll have to reload after every single attack. So head on over to the NCR or San Francisco if you want one of these, because they have the only merchants that sell it. The last variant is the FNFAL Night Sight, which includes some sort of scope or sight that enables for effective low light combat. The main advantage is the weapon Night Sight perk, which negates the low light aiming penalties that usually reduces accuracy. Fallout Tactics continues its trend of including real-world weapons exactly as they are in our world, and the FAL is no exception. Doing respectable damage and sporting a good range, it can be found in a few places like Kansas City, where many ghouls use it, or used by a select number of characters outside of Kansas City. The prevalence of the weapon in that specific area is interesting again, since it seems like having guns endemic to certain locales is a common characteristic in Fallout. 
New Vegas's service rifle is a common sight in the Mojave as this rifle is standard issue for its soldiers on the front lines in the war with the Legion. Chambered in 5.56 mm, the service rifle is a solid early game weapon that starts to suffer into the mid game. Although it may not be too useful in the late game, it can still help because with the jury rigging perk, it can fix weapons like the light machine gun, sniper rifle, and assault carbine. Josh Sawyer, when asked by a fan if the rifle is based on a combination of the AR-15 and AR-10, replied, sorta. And when looking at the design, that seems to bear out. One noticeable difference, however, is that the service rifle uses wood furniture rather than the brown composite material, something that is referenced again directly by Josh Sawyer when he answered a fan question. To the question, where does the NCR get the wood for its service rifles? Josh replied that it doesn't get wood from anywhere, since these are pre-war rifles, meaning that they have had wood furniture from at least the pre-war. This is an interesting statement, since the gun runners are the principal suppliers of service rifles to the NCR, and this seems to imply that the gun runners are therefore supplying the NCR with some huge supply of pre-war rifles. The gun runners machine their own weapons based on pre-war schematics and have grown so influential within the NCR that they are one of the most powerful organizations. I kind of have a hard time believing that they are providing the NCR with completely pre-war weapons, since those reserves would likely dry up, and putting in the effort into finding old pre-war weapons versus using your industrial capacity to build new ones just makes a lot more sense. There is also the common fan theory that the oil scarcity led to the military opting to use wood furniture over the composite plastic that has been commonly used in our world. The service rifle can accept two mods, the upgraded springs mod which increases the rate of fire by 30% and the forged receiver which increases the weapon's max condition by 50%. There were two cut upgrades, the reflex sight and the bayonet. The reflex sight gave the service rifle an option over just iron sights which would have been pretty nice and the bayonet would have been affixed to the front of the weapon. Both of them exist as static objects in game that are textured but cannot be spawned and added to the service rifle with console commands. The bayonet is the most interesting since being able to use the service rifle as a melee weapon would have been cool but require a bit of modification to the game's engine since a combined melee and ranged weapon is not an ability the game engine could perform until Fallout 4. With how ubiquitous this weapon is, it is somewhat surprising that there is only one unique variant, the survivalist rifle, which is one of my favorites in the whole game. Better in almost every single way, including damage, critical damage, HP, and even spread, the weapon only demands a little more AP than the base service rifle. It also has a different model, a shorter and thicker barrel, as well as an altered foregrip. This is a result of firing 12.7mm rounds rather than the 5.56, which is supposed to be inspired by the 50 caliber Beowulf rounds, as noted by Josh Sawyer once again. The weapon was used heavily, and this shows by having a slightly bent front sight and wire clamps that hold the wooden foregrip together, but most interestingly, has the words stop carved into one side and arrête carved into the other. Given that the aforementioned 50 caliber Beowulf round was designed with the needs of checkpoint defense in mind, this rifle appears to have performed that exact function up in the Great White North. Additionally, it appears this rifle was manufactured in US annexed Canada as well, as it is stamped on the receiver that it was produced in Ontario, USA territory. The survivalist is one of the most interesting characters due to his backstory and the use of this rifle in US occupied territory just deepens that fascinating background. The XL70E3 is a rifle that is first seen in Fallout 2 and later in Fallout Tactics as well. The in-game description states that it was an experimental weapon at the time of the Great War. It is made out of advanced materials and built in a way that allowed it to be broken down without the use of tools. This rifle fires 5mm ammunition like the assault rifle and can be found in only a couple spots. It is equipped by one punk on the oil tanker or has a 10% chance of spawning when bartering with the caravan masters just outside of San Francisco. The weapon is based on the Enfield 
XL70E3, which was a prototype of the SA-80 series of rifles used by the British military starting in the 1980s. It is interesting to think that a weapon developed in the 1980s in our world was created not long before the Great War in the Fallout universe, and is an example of how just because certain things may have happened or been invented earlier in our timeline does not mean the same thing for items and events in the Fallout world. Fallout Tactics officially calls the weapon the Enfield XL70E3, rather than just the model name like in Fallout 2, and gives it a boost in damage. With the low capacity being the only real limitation, it is one of the most powerful of the assault rifles in game. It can only be found in one location, in St. Louis, in the mutant base, in a crate. So if you really want to use this weapon, you know where you gotta go. Fallout Tactics has the M16A1, called in-game by the same name, although the sprite appears to be closer to an M16A2 rather than the A1. Regardless, although it doesn't do as much damage as other comparable rifles like the AK-47, it has a longer range that is impressively large. Firing 5.56mm ammunition, it can be found in a handful of places like Great Bend, Buena Vista, and Peoria and is a solid mid to late game weapon. Let's turn to Fallout 4 to talk about one of the more controversial weapon inclusions in the game, the Assault Rifle. This Chonky Boy is a capable weapon and can be found later in the game used by higher ranking enemies, often gunners or super mutants. Like all Fallout 4 weapons, it accepts a plethora of weapon modifications, allowing it to be fully automatic or single shot, as well as accept a variety of sights all in order to suit the player's build. The weapon takes a lot of artistic license, but the most noticeable and controversial aspect is the large barrel shroud that looks remarkably like the shroud used by the World War I era light machine gun, the Lewis gun. This along with the big chunky receiver makes just an enormous looking rifle, which, believe it or not, was the actual intent. And when fully modified, this thing can weigh 26 pounds, holy crap. In the art of Fallout 4, the assault rifle is said to have been one of the first weapons designed and modeled for the game, with the design meant to be a large weapon that would look appropriately sized and intimidating when wielded by power armored units. Additionally, although this is more well known, it's still worth mentioning, the in-game files of the assault rifle actually allude to the weapon being called a machine gun instead of an assault rifle, which makes more sense given the size and visual cues to the Lewis gun. For reasons that are unclear, it seems that the machine gun was renamed to be the assault rifle. Maybe this has something to do with the unfinished Chinese assault rifle asset. If the Chinese assault rifle was, for whatever reason, unable to be finished by the time the game released, they could have decided that an assault rifle was needed more than a machine gun, and therefore decided to make the switch. But we really only have conjecture, although it would be really interesting to hear the real reasons for the change. It is the only weapon to use 5.56 ammo in the entirety of Fallout 4, except for a unique legendary combat rifle, December's Child. And the in-game machine gun turrets also fire 5.56, further strengthening the real identity as a machine gun. Fallout 76 features the assault rifle in much the same form and with similar stats. It somehow has even more weapon mods now, with things like an aligned long barrel or prime receiver as well as unique legendary known as Whistle in the Dark. This legendary could be obtained either as a reward in survival mode in 2019, or as part of a daily ops reward. It has a pretty wild paint scheme, and has the Nocturnal and VATS enhanced perks, while boosting perception by one. One last thing I find funny is that this is one of the only weapons in Fallout 4 to not commit the sin of having the ejection port on the left side of the gun but then it has to fumble this win by being an absurdly huge and very unrealistic portrayal of an assault rifle, rather than a light machine gun. The M1 Garand is shown in Fallout Tactics in the same form as the real life rifle, and does a decent amount of damage for the early game. This World War II era rifle is actually not that common, being the most commonly found among the Beast Lords, and gains a larger than normal aiming bonus. In contrast though, it suffers more than other weapons when firing at close range. The Ruger AC-556F is named and modeled after the real world weapon of the same name, which was a version of the Mini-14 rifle. 
Boasting excellent damage for a rifle, its range suffers compared to other offerings. It can be found being used by Marden the Beast Lord, and interestingly, this weapon uses the submachine gun animations rather than the normal rifle animations in game. The Assault Carbine of Fallout New Vegas is a very high rate of fire, fully automatic rifle that can be a lot of fun to go completely ham, but it is balanced by the very low damage per bullet. To make this weapon even more interesting, it has armor penetration abilities with the normal 5mm ammo that it uses, bumping that penetration even higher with 5mm armor piercing rounds. There is only one mod, but it is kind of necessary to really be able to use the weapon, the extended magazine which adds 6 more shells between reloads. The weapon appears to be the closest to the Colt 733, and according to Josh Sawyer, was inspired by paratrooper oriented rifles, and according to him was not standard issue for the military. The prevalence of these carbines in New Vegas can be attributed to Nellis Air Force Base, and the boomers can be seen using many of these assault carbines as a result. There are two variants, the Gunrunner's version and Lily's assault carbine. The Gunrunner's version is the same as the base version except it can accept two more mods. The forged receiver will increase the weapon's condition by 33%, allowing it to be more durable, and the light bolt, which increases the rate of fire by 20% which is substantial given its already impressive rate of fire. Lily's Assault Carbine is a non-player usable weapon that is wielded by everyone's favorite grandma, Lily. The weapon is a little more powerful with extra critical damage, but the real kicker is that it's silenced and the only Assault Carbine to sport a silencer. If the player equips the weapon with console commands, the silencer will not be shown since no first person model with a silencer was made but the sound will be muffled and it will benefit from silenced effects. Just don't unequip it, otherwise it will disappear from the courier's inventory. On the topic of carbines, let's look at the other, the Marksman's Carbine, that also only features in Fallout New Vegas. It varies from the Assault Carbine with what appears to be a stainless steel barrel and magazine. Most notable though is the scope and the stock which has a cheek rest another indication that this is meant for longer distance engagements. The Marksman's Carbine is once again a Colt 733 or 933 with some extra components, like a scope and a cheek rest. Unlike the Assault Carbine, it fires the 5.56 round and does higher damage per bullet, higher critical damage, and most importantly, extremely low spread and the lowest AP requirement of any other rifle, rivaling most pistols as well. Unfortunately, the only mod for this weapon was cut from the game and was meant to be an extended magazine like the Assault Carbine. This too was meant to be a paratrooper oriented weapon and that is why it can only be found in New Vegas. The unique variant, All American, is superior to the vanilla weapon in every way, bumping almost every stat up a little bit, but it requires a gun skill of 100 to maximize its potential. Rather than being nearly all black, it has a woodland camo paint job, with the 82nd All-American Airborne Division insignia above the magazine well. It can be found in the Vault 34 Armory, and since this vault was filled to the brim with weapons before sealing shut at the time of the Great War, the All-American was likely brought into the vault by vault Tech. This is one of the most capable weapons in the whole game, especially for those invested in a small gun's build. The Browning Automatic Rifle or BAR looks more or less how it does in real life with a carrying handle and bipod which was normal to find on rifles issued during World War II. Doing solid damage and sporting a very good range, the BAR fires the 30 6 round so that high damage makes sense. It can be found on a body at Great Bend and is otherwise not very common. One cool thing about this weapon is that it does not suffer from a damage penalty when firing in burst mode like all other select fire weapons. The M14 in Fallout Tactics is exactly how it is in the real world, although the in-game description states that it uses 7.62mm ammo. When the weapon actually requires 303 in game, it is a good early game weapon, although it cannot compete with the other rifles we have gone over in this video. Three M14s can be found in a locker in Peoria. Fallout 4 gives us another insanely moddable weapon in the Combat Rifle, which is a common mid-game weapon that can be found in the Commonwealth and Appalachia. 
It is initially chambered in a 45 caliber round, but can be modified to shoot a 38 caliber round as well as a 308. With over a dozen receiver options, the ability to be single shot or automatic, long or short barrels, or a whole slew of sights and additions like a bayonet or a suppressor, the combat rifle can be tuned to any custom build. The overall look of the rifle is not bad and can be made to look pretty cool with all the potential modifications, but you wouldn't be blamed if you mistook it for the combat shotgun, which looks incredibly similar. When looking for a real world comparison, it has a vague resemblance to the PPSH-41, which Bethesda seems to have a particular fondness for, since the combat shotgun in Fallout 3 is almost a complete copy of the World War II era submachine gun. Although we have no background information on this weapon, its visual similarity to the combat shotgun would seem to indicate that they were made by the same company, but that's only a guess. I would really like some background information on some of these new Fallout 4 additions, because we get no lore background with most of them, which is just a shame. There are two variants, the fan favorite Overseer's Guardian and December's Child. The Overseer's Guardian is available for sale at Vault 81 by Alexis Combs and can make a great early and mid game gun, and depending on the build and weapon mods, can even be effective into the late game. The secret sauce is the two shot legendary effect, dealing double the damage of a normal combat rifle. But the Guardian also has a much higher single shot damage compared to the vanilla rifle. This makes it the most powerful weapon chambered in the 45 caliber and can be a very good way to put 45 ammo to use later in the game. December's Child is found in the Vim Pop Factory in Far Harbor, in the secret medical lab. It has a legendary effect that is not shown in game, but is called in the in-game files M4 Carbine, and is supposed to reduce the overall weight, increase fire rate by 25%, increase reload speed by 15%, and most interestingly, allow the rifle to fire 5.56 millimeter ammo. Now I say it's supposed to do that stuff because it doesn't actually reduce the weapon's weight, and the change from 45 ammo to 5.56 is not accompanied by any increase in damage. This makes it a decidedly less useful weapon, because 5.56 is a lot harder to come by than 45 caliber which is quite plentiful, so to switch to a rarer ammo type for no damage benefit is kinda silly. That means the only positive effect is the faster fire rate and reload speed, which is a little disappointing. The combat rifle is also in Fallout 76, with somehow even more weapons mods and paint job options, enough to truly boggle the mind. It is commonly used by enemies of all types, and unlike in Fallout 4, cannot be chambered in 308, with only 38 and 45 caliber options available. One unique variant, the Fixer, is a reward for finishing the quest Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, and has a whole slew of effects. It adds a stealth bonus, increases movement speed by 20% when sneaking, and increases damage by 20%, making it overall a very capable weapon. Fallout 4's Nuka World add-on gave us a new assault rifle that is familiar to nearly everyone, the Handmade Rifle. In its vanilla form, the Handmade Rifle has a bizarre choice for a stock, a shovel handle. Looking at the rifle, it looks as if that's the only homemade part, as everything else looks professionally made, and I have to wonder, what could have possibly caused so many of these rifles to lose their stocks? The obvious inspiration is an AK-47, however, an upgraded stock gives the handmade rifle a Galil-type stock, and further modifications can turn it into a semi-automatic sniper rifle that most closely resembles an SVD due to the distinctive stock. The handmade rifle fires a newly introduced round, the 7.62 which is rare and powerful, really only being found in Nuka World which can make it difficult to feed this machine. In addition to an insane number of weapons mods, it can also have different paint schemes that relates to the different raider groups in Nuka World. It is interesting to note that this rifle uses more perks to access weapon mods, requiring more than just science or gun nut like most vanilla weapons. There are two variants, Splatter Cannon and the Problem Solver. Splatter Cannon is sold in the Nuka Town market 
and has the Furious effect, which increases damage with each consecutive hit on target. The Problem Solver is given by Mason, the leader of the pack, but only under certain conditions. Upon meeting him, the player must use all the right hand speech options, which are the aggressive ones, and then pass a speech check. Failing the check will lock the player out of getting this weapon. This would be a shame since it is the most powerful of all variants, and can become even more capable when adding weapon mods. The weapon will also come with the pack paint job, but a part of me wishes they would have chosen a different legendary effect, since this also comes with the furious legendary effect, just like the splatter cannon. The hunting rifle of Fallout and Fallout 2 is known in-game as the Colt Rangemaster, and is a semi-auto rifle that prides itself on a very respectable range, even though it only has iron sights. Chambered in 223, it is a great early game weapon and capable mid game weapon, but it is outclassed by the sniper rifle later on. The sprite doesn't give us much to go on, but it seems most similar to the M1 carbine if anything at all. It is easily available in many places and carried by a number of enemies in the first Fallout. And in Fallout 2, what is this? It can actually get a scope? Well that's cool. With the scope equipped, the player can achieve a 95% hit chance at the farthest distances, which is really great, but the chosen one will not be able to target enemies that are too close, so do not make that mistake. In Fallout Tactics, this weapon features again, mostly in the same form, but is now chambered in 7.62mm. It is an early game weapon found at Brahminwood, and the character Farsight will start with it as well. It has a close range penalty, which... Now that I think about my tactics playthrough, that sure explains a lot. The Stayer is shown in-game much like the real-world gun of the same name, and is easier to find than one might think. It can be found carried by a number of Reavers in Junction City, some Brotherhood of Steel Deserters, or Glenda Close in Newton. This is another assault rifle that uses submachine gun animations rather than the rifle ones. Jeez, tactics. One weapon I missed in my first video was the so-called automatic rifle in the Dead Money DLC for New Vegas. Chambered in 308, it can be found in several places at the Sierra Madre, but nowhere else in the Mojave. So I guess this weapon was specifically chosen by Sinclair for their security forces at the resort. The weapon is most visually similar to the Browning automatic rifle, although there are some creative liberties taken. This hard-hitting rifle has the highest damage of any fully automatic weapon in the whole game. Although this is undercut by the slow rate of fire, awful spread, high AP cost, and low weapon durability. The weapon can take one modification, the upgraded internals, which increases the fire rate by 10%, which is nice, but it would be cool to do something about the terrible durability as well. This very cool looking weapon is one of the longest in the game, with the barrel close to clipping through the ground, and it also has a bipod that is not deployable in game. It is time to end this video with the only Rad King sanctioned rifle of the wasteland, one that bestows others with Adam's holy glow. The Radium Rifle was introduced in Fallout 4 in the Far Harbor DLC, and is a very interesting looking and operating weapon. Shooting 45 caliber rounds, what makes this weapon stand out is that it will deal additional radiation damage on top of the ballistic damage, which helps make this a very potent weapon. This rifle is a pre-war carbine that has since been modified with a series of wires, circuit boards, and capacitors running along the length. The placement of these elements seem to correspond to where a bullet might rest or pass through during normal operation and so we may surmise that they are blasting the ammunition with radiation at these points, imbuing them with Adam's power. How effective such a setup would be is not very clear, but it would certainly pose a danger to the user and those around them since the amount of radiation that would be needed to quickly irradiate normal, non-irradiated rounds would be pretty immense. Additionally, the gun's report is rather unique with some lingering, whirring type sound, which would seem to correspond to the irradiating components. The base weapon is actually almost a one-for-one -one representation of the Volkssturmgewehr VG-45, a World War II era weapon that was made near the end of the war to try and create a capable but easy to produce weapon. 
why or how the children of Adam in Far Harbor came into possession of a big stash of such rifles is unknown, and I would like to hear your speculation. This rifle also gets a bevy of weapon mods, letting it suit almost any playstyle, but it is funny that the long barrel mod doesn't actually increase the barrel's length and instead installs some sort of dish on the end. There are two unique variants, Radical Conversion and the Kiloton Radium Rifle. Radical Conversion can be earned by finishing the Ablutions quest, which requires the Soul Survivor to help fix the decontamination arches at the Nucleus. It has the Penetrator legendary effect which ignores 30% of the enemy's damage resistance, but is otherwise the same as the base rifle. My personal favorite, the Kiloton Rifle, is available for sale by Kane at the Nucleus and has the Explosive effect, making it similar to the Spray and Pray, which is legendary for its destructive capabilities, but it has the extra radiation damage. It also gets a damage boost, so its bullets do more damage, do radiation damage, and then a plus 15 area of effect damage on each shot. Kill a ton, indeed. Say what you will about the radium rifle, but the unique legendaries have some of the best names. That is it for the list, but not the video. Before I get to the comment highlights for my last few videos, I want to thank my patrons, who have truly shown their devotion to Adam by donating a few caps. You guys really do make the magic happen. So let's look at some comments from my AIs of Fallout Part 2 video. There were a number of you in the comments that didn't know that Mr. New Vegas was an AI, and it's perfectly understandable. The proof of the claim is outside of the game, in a blog that Bethesda published. I don't think Mr. New Vegas being an AI really detracts from him as a character though. A few of you like the Biggie J Man commented on the rather absurd number of AIs in Fallout 76, and I tend to agree. There really was no other alternative for wanting a game devoid of any other NPCs, since you need some level of dynamic quest giving and something that can force its will on the character. So AIs were a rather natural choice. Honestly, integrating AIs with the story of Appalachia, with many pre-war stories being focused on the dynamics between corporate greed and workers' rights, was very interesting. However, running into AIs in 76 became less and less interesting as time went on because of how many there were. Scrungle Bungle made a good connection between GLaDOS and MODIS, and I think there's something to be said with how they seem to share a good number of similarities. I wouldn't doubt it if some of MODIS' design drew inspiration from GLaDOS. Even the names seem somewhat similar. Wayne Igo brought up how Modus's representation in Fallout 76 reminded them of Arnim Zola from the MCU, and I totally see where you're coming from. I definitely get that vibe as well. A few of you, like the Watchful One, corrected me that the Cage of Mole Rats that was referenced by the book shoot was a reference to the other George Orwell book, 1984, not Fahrenheit 451, like most of his other dialogue seems to reference. On the subject of the sink, some of you wanted to point out to me that the sink and all the personalities in it are not AIs. To be fair, I said as much in the video, but they're just too much fun to not talk about, and they were close enough so I made an exception in that particular case. On my video about some Cold War things that I wanted to see in new fallouts, one of the most common comments I got, and rightly so, was that I forgot to reference the X-17 meteorological station at the Big MT when talking about weather manipulation. That is a great point that I failed to address, and is worth an entire discussion itself. But yes, we do have an example in New Vegas of weather manipulation, and it is also inferred that such efforts were undertaken in Fallout 76 too, although it's not as obvious. Now, the next step is to take the weather manipulation to the point that I really want to see, and mentioned in my video, dynamic extreme weather. Come on, Bethesda. Many of you had great ideas about atomic gardening, and I'm glad that resonated with so many of you like it did me. I saw a lot of talk about getting new mutated plant enemies from these, or even making them useful to the player by allowing us to create atomic gardens that have a chance to spawn a fruit or vegetable with a beneficial effect. Honestly, this all seems very feasible in the current Fallout engine, and a talented modder could make this. I did love that Patrick Yorth here didn't wait for modders or Bethesda 
and just went straight into making his own atomic garden. What an atomic Chad. On my cartography video about raider bosses and their groups, I was happy to see so many people enjoy the video. I will be integrating this into my video rotation. And while I will be focusing on Fallout 4 for now, I will expand it to include all the other games. There were a lot of comments that were fairly similar that talked about how they wish the raider system would have taken at least one step further, whether it was making the named bosses into true bosses with legendaries or dynamic systems similar to the goblin tribe mechanic from Oblivion. I definitely agree. A more dynamic faction system would make some of our actions feel like they make a difference. Clearing out a location should in many cases lead it to being populated by different groups, with the option of completely clearing the map of certain enemy types if you really wanted to, like taking out all the super mutants. Several of you, like Mina Bosma here, mentioned how the raiders at Libertalia could have possibly been pirates, or otherwise used boats to threaten trade or other groups. I think this is a good idea. And even one mention in a terminal somewhere about this would have been cool to expand the group into something a little more interesting. It would also explain why they could threaten Bunker Hill so directly if any trade is conducted by sea. As Ragan Chiron hit the nail on the head with his comment, and perhaps I didn't communicate it very well in my video, when considering unnamed raiders to be part of a raider boss's group, I often think of them as some kind of tributary or a group that cooperates with the main raider boss, due to how strong these raider bosses are and the number of people they can command. So while these raiders probably wouldn't die for that raider boss, they will follow orders so as not to draw any ire. Several of you spoke of James Wire, the old Minuteman turned Libertalia raider boss that goes missing partway through the game and how it would be a great random encounter to run into him after he goes missing maybe even trying to make up for the atrocities he committed as a raider, and I think that is a stellar idea. Several of you also mentioned how the Norwegian ghouls on the FMS North Star are probably not raiders, considering that many of their lines tell the sole survivor to leave them alone, or to get off their ship, or even asking why you are there. This is a good point, and they are probably only designated as raiders in-game and always hostile because they seem to ride the line between settlers and raiders. I don't really know how else you would designate a group that may not be conventional raiders, but will oppose any contact with people to the point of killing them. In my video about the Syringer and how it helped me understand Fallout 4, I was surprised at how many people felt similar towards the Syringer. I thought I was just weird to have been so excited by such a random and inconsequential weapon, but it appears I'm in good company. I was also glad to see so many people that appreciated the modding community and how they help plug shortcomings in the game or keep games fresh between installments. You go modders. All right, that is it for now. This video has gone on long enough. Go and bring Adam's message to all of his children. Take care of yourselves and I will see you soon.